So let's uh, turn to the Old Testament book of Jonah and read the introduction, the first four verses there. Um, in my version, it's uh, page 928, but you have the advantage of the screen <laughs> to look at. This is Jonah chapter one, and we're going to look at the first four verses. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish, He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. And after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. And then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. Now, as far as I can work it out, This autumn marks my 50th anniversary of teaching the Bible in church settings like this. I started when I was only five. (laughs) But over, over that time, I have never taught the book of Jonah. Not once. So it was a refreshing, new, and scary challenge for me when the elders invited me to take these four weeks to teach it. I have to say from the start that I am very much a learner amongst learners. What a brilliant story, beautifully written. It's many a child's favorite Bible study, of course. A runaway prophet caught up in a huge storm at sea, tossed into the waves, only to be swallowed whole by a big fish. Three dark nights in the creature's stomach where he has opportunity to repent, to restore his relationship with God before being spewed out onto dry land. Then taking the second chance he was given to obey God, to bring his word to the pagan city of Nineveh, not forgetting about the mysterious plant that grows up to shade Jonah from the sun and is then eaten by a worm. What's not to like? But that is often where it remains, a children's story at the level of Jack and the Beanstalk or fantasy fiction like Fantastic Beasts or Lord of the Rings. As a story, as a book, it's simply and beautifully constructed. It comes in two parallel halves, each beginning with the phrase, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. The first time we get the phrase, Jonah runs from God, only for God then to intervene dramatically within nature to teach him deep lessons about God's grace, which lead him to repentance and indeed to composing a powerful poem of praise to God. And then the second time we get the phrase, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Jonah, this time, in contrast, obeys the Lord and goes to the city of Nineveh, delivers God's message, and the people of Nineveh are brought to repentance and all ends happily ever after. Well, no, it doesn't. Because there's a twist Our expectations are upended. The second time, there's no psalm of praise from Jonah at the response to his preaching. Instead, he protests. He is angry with God. And God responds by teaching him more lessons about his grace, once again through a dramatic intervention in the natural world. But Jonah is still angry. And then the story ends abruptly with an unanswered question from God to Jonah. There is no neat tying up of ends. So the simplicity of this story is deceptive. The children's story we expect 
gives way to something unexpected, something that is going to raise very big themes, mercy, justice, grace, anger, forgiveness, and more. And it will at times raise uncomfortable questions for us. So three major things to think about this morning as we come to it. First is the coming of the word of the Lord. Second is the content of that word. And then finally, there's Jonah's response to it. Now, I was going to give you three C's, but I decided just like Jonah to give you an unexpected twist. So you have two C's and then an R, okay? Can you cope with that? I hope you can. But first, we have to deal, I think, with the elephant in the room. What about the fantastic elements in the story, such as the big fish? Hebrew language had no word for whale. Every sea creature was a fish, but the word for fish is modified here by the addition of great or huge now, as you may know, there have been various naturalistic explanations for the identity of this big fish. For example, was it a sperm whale, a white shark, a whale shark, or perhaps even some now extinct sea creature? As long as it had a gullet and a stomach large enough to swallow a human whole. But many just dismiss all of that because they simply regard the story as a fable or a parable or even a fairy story and certainly not meant to be taken literally as history. And they can't see how any rational, scientifically educated human being could possibly believe in this stuff. Indeed, some skeptics even went as far as denying the existence of the city of Nineveh, despite the frequent references in the Bible to it, until, of course, in the 19th century, the city was discovered and was excavated. Now, the book of Jonah itself doesn't provide a purely naturalistic explanation. Rather, it claims that God intervened first, by sending the storm, then by preparing the sea creature, whatever it was, then by keeping Jonah alive in the belly of the fish, and finally by having him vomited out on dry land. All stated in a very matter-of-fact way. There is no hype. It's just stated and then left. It is presented as an account of a real person and real events. There's nothing in Jonah that indicates the story is a fable. And in addition, as a Christian, I have to take seriously the fact that Jesus himself referred to this specific incident. And there's no indication that he saw it as anything other than an event within history that happened to a real person because he used it as a picture of his coming burial and resurrection. Of course, the resurrection is a far <coughs> greater miracle than anything concerning the big fish. And that brings us to the real question, I think. If there is a creator who designed things, designed the universe to run as it normally does, can he not, if he so chooses, intervene to make things go differently? Logically, of course, he can. Because if he can't, then exit Jesus' miracles, exit the incarnation, exit the resurrection, exit Christianity. A God who is unable to intervene within human history can't save anyone. And we are wasting our time here. 
First century people didn't believe in the resurrection because they were irrational, uneducated, scientifically naive. Everyone knew then, as they know now, that dead bodies don't rise. That's why Christ rising from the dead had such an impact. If it had been normal to expect dead bodies to rise, then one more resurrection was just one more resurrection. Who cared? It would have made no difference. It made an impact because it was self-evidently God's intervention. Now, the Bible itself warns us to exercise caution and proper scrutiny regarding claims of miracles, but science does not and cannot rule them out. If we decide to rule them out, then it's not science or rationality that drives us to that. It's our own materialistic worldview. So let's think of this, because the bigger challenge to me is not the big fish. The bigger challenge is the opening line. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. The word of the Lord, the Lord's word, God's word came into history to a real person. Now, this phrase is frequently used in the Old Testament, although normally not as it is here. Normally, it occurs in an ongoing narrative to introduce a new element or event. We saw that in 1 Samuel when we were doing the life of David. We read in chapter 15, then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. Or else the wording is used at the start of other prophetic books such as Zechariah, and then is followed up by God's detailed message for the nation. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, son of Berechiah. But in Jonah, there's no mention of date, of historic context, which makes it abrupt and possibly slightly disorientating, certainly grabs her attention, and the phrase isn't followed by a direct message from God to the Jewish nation. This is personal. This is to Jonah and is followed up then by the story of Jonah's response. The book of Kings confirms that Jonah was indeed a prophet who served during the reign of King Jeroboam about over 750 years before the coming of Jesus. So we're talking a long way back in history. Now, how exactly the word of the Lord came to Jonah, we aren't told. But of course, the Creator isn't hard up for ways of communicating. We're simply told, first, it happened. But secondly, we are given the content of the word these instructions to go to the great city of Nineveh, to preach against it, because the wickedness of the city had come up before the Lord. So this wasn't merely some impression he got, some gut feeling that he had. It was a clear, specific, content-rich communication from outside this world, from the Lord. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. And that phrase sits, as I've said, over the two halves of the book. The action, the entire action of the book in the first half and the second is in response to that phrase. It is all kicked off by the word of the Lord coming. And that raises this simple, basic question. Do we believe it? Can we believe it? That this is God speaking real words into human history. That these words carry his authority. Chris, words matter. The Christian God is a speaking God. 
Genesis tells us that this universe, this world, began with God speaking. And God said, let there be light. That doesn't mean that God has a voice box like us. It's a metaphor. But it's a metaphor for something real. Words, information, intelligence, real communication. We live in a word-based universe. God feeding in the information from the outside. That is why the universe is intelligible. That is why science can be done. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God, says Hebrews. John writes, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. And we humans were created in the image of God uniquely out of all creation to be able to converse with God. Sad, isn't it, then, when we are silent towards Him? And we have nothing to say to the one who created us and give us the facility of language to use as a core part of relationship with him. Sad too when we treat his words as just words on a page. God's words are the highest form of his self-expression and revelation to us, culminating in the one who is the word who became flesh. God amongst us. What an amazing gift words are. A gift that lies at the heart of relationship. It's no accident that the first recorded use of human language was that of Adam responding to his wife. Words also mark out the basis of our moral moral relationship with God. God gave our first parents a word. The word of the Lord came to them, a command, which they were expected to obey out of trust and love. God said, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will surely die. And if they had replied at that point, why? The sufficient answer is, because God says so. This is God's word. And God is God. And we are not. And they had to decide what they were going to do with this word, this command, this prohibition. Were they going to trust God and obey him? And we face the same question. This is so important. At the end of what we call the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus used his famous illustration of the wise and foolish builders, and he taught that his words provide the only foundation strong enough on which to build our lives. Do we believe him? One of the first questions in the Bible was the question the devil put. Did God really say? Questioning his word, undermining their trust in it. I told you before about the incident that happened at Stan Millis many years ago when uh, my wife Heather was doing her religious education training And her lecture, while claiming to be a Christian, had followed the prevailing theological trends of removing anything miraculous from the gospel and was reducing it to the teaching of ethics, what was called then the new morality, which turned out mostly to be the old immorality, because it was a rejection in the end 
of the apostles' teaching, for example, on human sexuality. At one point in these lectures, Heather drew the lecturer's attention to Jesus' words in Luke 10, 18. Let me quote them. Whoever listens to you, Jesus said to his apostles, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. And whoever rejects me, rejects him who sent me. In other words, we can't reject the teaching of Christ's apostles while at the same time claim to accept and follow and love Jesus. It can't be done. If we reject them, we reject him. Her lecture wasn't at all happy. But this is the reality. As the text of Jonah puts it, to reject God's word is to run away from God himself. We can't claim to love Jesus and reject his word. So each of us, <coughs> therefore, will have to make up his or her own mind. Is this God's word or not? Is it of divine origin? Is it truly the word of the Lord? Or is it merely a human word that we can play around with and decide which bits we like and which bits we don't like? This is critical. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. The word of the Lord comes to us. It speaks to one of the core questions of our age. Who says so? What's the ultimate authority? Who has the authority to say what is right or wrong? But in our context, it's so easy to get used to the idea that there is no ultimate authority, that it is down to us to decide what is true for us and right for us and what is truly authentic which means in the end that when the Bible says things we agree with, we're happy. But when it doesn't, we aren't. And we will find whatever reasons we can to reject what it says because the Bible has to be made to fit with us. But if this is truly God's word, that approach surely can't be right. It cannot be right that I have the last word, or that culture has the last word. God's word challenges all cultures, which means it challenges our own. The Jesus who doesn't cut across the prevailing thinking and values of the 2020s world is as inauthentic as the Jesus who didn't challenge the prevailing thinking and values of the 1950s world into which I was born. The gospel is not in step with any culture. It never has been. It never will be. It was never intended to be. If you follow me, said Christ, the world will hit you. As Christians, we are aliens in the world. We're not at home. So we, as I said, each need to make up our mind. Has God's word come to us and then follow through so that we have more than a theoretic belief that the Bible is God's word, but rather it's a lived practical conviction, a supreme value, the voice that displaces other voices. The next two focuses are much briefer than that one. The content of the word to Jonah, as challenging as the origin of the word is, so is the content. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness, says God, has come up before me. Now, it may not seem this way to us, but this is stunning for a Jewish prophet to get this kind of instruction. A Jewish prophet's normal task was to bring God's message to God's people, not leave Israel and go to a Gentile city. And it was also shocking because Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire, one of the most cruel and violent empires of ancient times. Why send them a prophet? Why warn them? 
Was this God in his mercy actually giving such people an opportunity to repent? Why would he do that? The specific wickedness of Nineveh is not spelled out here, but perhaps the prophet Nahum may give us a hint of it, and you can read that at home. But according to Nahum, Nineveh, after initially responding well to Jonah's preaching, as we will see, would eventually return to its evil ways and produce one, and I quote, who plots evil against the Lord and devises wicked plans. What kind of evil was it in Nineveh? Well, at least the commercial and religious evil that is common to great cities. And according to the experts, Nineveh is now believed to be the largest city on earth at that time. Nahum tells us it was a wealthy city full of gold and silver. He speaks of its rapacious commercial practices, stripping assets like locusts strip a field. He tells us of its sorceries and witchcraft, a city that enslaved the nations around it by her influence in prostitution and witchcraft, probably a reference to its false religion with all their enslaving immoral practices. It was, says Nahum, a city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims, enslaved. So extreme in its wickedness that while God is aware of everything, it came up before him in a special way and God was not going to put up with it forever. He was going to judge and yet first he would send Jonah to warn them, which gives us an insight into the heart of God for the world. Not just interested in the Jewish nation. He chose them for a special Role, but he's the God of the whole world. He's interested in the whole world. And in his kindness and mercy, he gives people an opportunity to repent. Indeed, according to the Bible, everyone receives a certain amount of light from God. God reveals himself in some way to everyone be it through creation, through moral awareness and conscience, or through his words. We don't all receive the same amount, but we all are given some, as Paul argues in Romans, even those who don't have the full revelation of God's law in verbal form still demonstrate that there is a law written on their hearts. We all have a basic deep down knowledge of right and wrong, of fairness and unfairness. We may disagree on some of the detail, but evil is evil. Certain behaviors are just wrong. And all of us, says Paul, engage in doing one of two things, usually two of two things. The first is judging others. We all do it. And the second is excusing ourselves, making it clear that we know that we ourselves fall short and we try to make excuses for it. But so we know that we are guilty and in a moral universe, we are accountable to the moral governor and we're all given the opportunity to respond to what God reveals and to cast ourselves on the mercy of the moral governor of the universe. Jonah was given the task to go to this pagan city to remind them not only that they were accountable to God, but that God was going to intervene in judgment, which was probably not terribly popular, just as it wouldn't be popular today I do regularly read the papers, at least online, and listen to as much news as I can cope with before I need to go out and throw something at somebody. Or not somebody, but, you know. The media is very quiet about this. 
All talk of justice is merely at the horizontal human level. There's almost never a reference to the fact that ultimately we are accountable to the Creator and that He is going to judge. I admire Justin Welby's courage at the funeral of the Queen and speaking of the judgment of God. It takes great courage in a contemporary world. How did Jonah respond? He said nothing, didn't protest, didn't argue. He just ran as far and as fast as he could in the opposite direction. Tarshish is in the opposite direction to Nineveh. He went first to Joppa on the coast. He bought a boat journey, which probably meant he paid for the entire ship. A boat that would take him as far west as he could go. Now listen, this is not an atheist we're talking about. He was a prophet. He believed in God. He knew that the message and instructions he had received had come directly from God, that the word of the Lord had come to him, and yet he ran away. Illogical, yes, but very human. Why did he do it? Well, we're not told here. So inevitably, when you're not given the information about a person's motives, you always jump to ask why. Was he frightened, perhaps, to bring such a message to foreign pagans? Was he too tender-hearted to talk about wickedness and judgment? Or did he feel he wasn't the right man? Or did he need a break? Or that God's plan was wrong? Well, we will eventually discover the reason he ran in Jonah's own word. But there is a gap between the event of his running and the explanation for it. And that gap does a number of things. First, it helps build the drama of the story. Second, it so easily misleads us. It's potentially deliberate misdirection. Gets us thinking in the wrong way so that then the real answer will shock us. Thinking wrongly about the character of Jonah, the nature of his relationship with God, so that the explanation comes as a surprise. But thirdly and finally, it gives a space for us to move from asking, why did Jonah run away from God? To asking, why does anyone run away from God? And perhaps even, why am I running from God? I wonder, do you think it's possible that in the church there are Jonas who have never physically run away? They're still here. But they've run away here and here. Is that possible? Might you be one of them? Might it be the case that while you do your best to keep up appearances to your friends and family, especially in church, privately, you've largely given up on the opening phrase of this prophecy. This isn't the word of the Lord. It doesn't have real authority in your life. You're listening to other voices. And instead of allowing the word to challenge and change your world, you're allowing your world to challenge and change the world. And it has ceased to become a lived reality in your life. So that then you're running the danger of doing what Jesus warned about, calling him Lord and not doing what he said. The word of the Lord has come. Jesus is the word of God incarnate. He has entrusted his truth to his historic 
apostles, and prophets. As Jesus said, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them. And we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Let's pray. O oh Lord, may this ancient book become in our experience living word of God, active, powerful, discerning our thoughts, our motives, our intentions, revealing Jesus, revealing ourselves, showing us your wisdom, showing us your majesty, your greatness. Speak to us, we pray, both today and these coming weeks, through your living word, in Jesus' name. Amen.